Hi. In this video, I will introduce circular motion and the equations we use to describe it. If an object, such as a wheel, is rotating at a steady speed, we call this uniform circular motion. How fast is a point on that wheel's rim going? We know that the speed is constant because it's uniform circular motion, so we can use v speed equals distance d divided by time t. The distance moved by the point as it completes a full revolution is equal to the circumference of the circle. The circumference can be calculated as 2 pi r, where r is the radius. And the time it takes to complete one full revolution we call the time period, which we use the capital T symbol for. So the linear speed of a point undergoing circular motion can be calculated as v equals 2 pi r divided by time period capital T. And since frequency, the number of revolutions per second, is equal to 1 over the time period, that means we can write the velocity as v equals 2 pi r f. You may already be familiar with the unit, the radian. It is used to measure angles as an alternative to degrees. In one full circle, there are 360 degrees and 2 pi radians. So to convert from degrees to radians, we divide by 360 and multiply by 2 pi. Or to go in the other direction from radians to degrees, we divide by 2 pi and multiply by 360. We use radians when we describe how far an object has moved in circular motion. We call this angular displacement and we use the symbol theta. It's effectively the angle through which a rotating object has moved. In one full rotation, it will have an angular displacement of 2 pi radians. If we know how long it has taken for an object in circular motion to have a particular angular displacement, we can calculate its angular speed, for which we use the Greek symbol lowercase omega, that is not a w. Since in one full rotation it is travelling 2 pi radians, in a time period t, we can say that omega, the angular velocity, is equal to 2 pi divided by t. And the unit for that is radians per second. And again, we know that frequency is 1 over t, so this can also be written as 2 pi f. Now let's relate that back to our earlier equation for linear velocity, v equals 2 pi rf, and we can see that v must therefore be equal to omega multiplied by r, where r is the radius of the circle, so that gives us a quick way to be able to switch between linear speeds measured in meters per second and angular speeds measured in radians per second. Newton's first law says that an object will continue moving at a constant velocity unless an external force acts on it. Is an object in uniform circular motion travelling at a constant velocity? Well, it is travelling at a constant speed, but it is always changing direction, so it has a changing velocity. If we have a changing velocity, what must be happening? An acceleration. We call this centripetal acceleration. Without this acceleration, the object would fly off in a straight line. So the centripetal acceleration must be acting towards the centre of the circle. In circular motion, the acceleration is always towards the centre of the circle. In fact, centripetal means centre seeking. We can calculate centripetal acceleration with the equation a equals v squared divided by r. And since we know that v equals omega r, we can write this in terms of omega as a equals omega squared multiplied by r. According to Newton's second law, if we have an acceleration, we must have a resultant force. The resultant force that causes a centripetal acceleration is called a, a centripetal force. Since F equals ma from Newton's second law, centripetal force F must equal mv squared divided by r or m omega squared multiplied by r. The two most important things to remember about centripetal force in uniform circular motion are number one, it is always, always, always towards the centre of the circle. 
Therefore, it is always perpendicular to the motion of the object, perpendicular to the velocity. And number two, it is a resultant force. It is not a force in its own right, like friction or gravitational force. It is simply the resultant of other forces. We're going to consider this in a moment through some examples. First, let's imagine we're driving a car over this humpback bridge, which has a radius of 5 metres. We know that there must be a certain speed we can drive at that would cause our car to lose contact with the road and get some air. This would happen when the forces acting are unable to maintain uniform circular motion. Can we calculate that speed? Let's start by drawing the forces acting on our car as it reaches the top of the bridge. It has a weight, mg, acting vertically down, and it has a normal contact force, which we'll call N, acting vertically upwards. If the car was travelling on a flat road, these two forces would be equal. However, for the car to move in circular motion over the bridge, it needs a resultant centripetal force downwards, towards the centre of the circle. This means that the weight, mg, must be bigger than the normal contact force, N. The maximum centripetal force that can be provided would be when n equals zero, so the resultant force would be equal to mg. So therefore our centripetal force, mv squared divided by r, would be equal to the weight, mg. We can cancel the m's and rearrange to get v equals the square root of g multiplied by r. So plugging in our value for the radius of the bridge, 5 meters, we get v equals the square root of 9.81 multiplied by 5, which gives us a velocity of around 7 meters per second. That's about 16 miles per hour. So that gives us the maximum velocity that, that a car can travel over this bridge while still maintaining circular motion. Above this speed, the centripetal force that would be needed to maintain circular motion would be larger than the weight that was available to provide it, so the car would lose contact with the road. Notice here that the only thing that matters is the speed, the mass of the car, the quality of the tyres, none of those things will make a difference to how fast you can take this bridge. As we continue our journey home, we hit a corner. How fast can we take this corner without the car skidding? Again, let's consider the forces acting. This time, we're interested in horizontal circular motion. What forces are acting to keep our car in circular motion on a flat road? The only force is the friction between the tyres and the road, and that frictional force has a maximum value. If the required centripetal force F, which is equal to mv squared over r, exceeds that maximum frictional force, our car will not maintain circular motion and will skid off the road. The radius of the turn r and the mass of the car m are both fixed, so the centripetal force that's needed is proportional only in this case to v squared. What conditions could cause this maximum frictional force between the tyres and the road to decrease, therefore requiring us to drive even more slowly to complete the turn? Well, a wet road, an icy road, or tyres in poor condition would all require us to take the corner more slowly because the smaller frictional force available will only be able to provide a smaller centripetal force. So V will have to decrease. On our way home, we take a slip road to join the motorway. This road bends, but it is also banked, meaning the road surface is on an angle. How does this help us to stay on the road at higher speeds? In our previous example, the only force acting towards the center of the circle was the friction between the tires and the road. However, on a banked track, we also have a component of the normal contact force acting towards the centre too. This means that for the same tyres, at the same speed, the frictional force can afford to be lower because the normal contact force can provide some, or even all, of the centripetal force. Finally, we've arrived home after this quite hair-raising journey and um, urgently need to wash our underpants. We put them into the washing machine and consider the centripetal forces keeping them in vertical uniform circular motion. Are the forces acting on the clothes constant throughout each spin in the washing machine? First, let's consider the pants when they're at the bottom of the drum. They are in uniform circular motion, so we know that there must be 
a centripetal force acting towards the centre of the drum, that is, upwards. What are the forces acting on the clothes at the bottom? We have their weight acting down, and we have a normal contact force between the pants and the drum acting upwards. Now we know that there must be a resultant force, a centripetal force equal to mv squared divided by r, acting upwards. So that resultant force must be equal to the normal contact force n, take away the weight mg. What happens to the forces when the pants reach the top of the drum? The centripetal force must continue to act towards the centre, which is now downwards. The weight has not changed and it is still acting downwards. But now the normal contact force is also acting downwards. This means that our centripetal force at the top of the drum, mv squared over r, must be equal to the normal contact force plus the weight, because both the normal contact force and the weight are now acting in the same direction. So how is this possible? Well, the mass of the pants do not change, nor does gravity. The velocity is set by the washing machine and the radius is fixed. The only variable that can change is n, the normal contact force. Therefore, at the bottom of the drum, the normal contact force must be larger than at the top of the drum because at the bottom it is having to both overcome the weight and provide a centripetal force, whereas at the top the weight is providing a centripetal force anyway, so the normal contact force can be smaller or perhaps even zero.